So my name, like I said, is Corinne Goodwin. I'm executive director of Eastern PA Trans Equity Project. Tonight's subject is changing your name in Pennsylvania. So uh, let's strap in and get moving here. Um, I'm gonna start off with a disclaimer, right? And just uh, make sure that we're all kind of covering our legal bases. So, you know, this presentation and the information contained therein uh, is really for informational purposes only. And um, you should not be uh, construing this as legal advice. So we are not attorneys. We are an organization that's run by trans people for the benefit of trans people. We're pretty darn good at the legal name change business, but we are not attorneys and we're not representing you in court. Our goal tonight is to teach you how to represent yourself in court. Um, so just to make sure you know that, for answers of very specific legal questions, you may want to seek counsel from an attorney. We do have a list of attorneys um, that uh, are trans affirming who might be able to help you. And of course, this is a, an educational presentation. So now that we have all that legalese out of the way, we can kind of get started. Um, as a reminder, this presentation really is specifically speaking to the name change process in Pennsylvania. Um, other states have different processes. So some of them have easier processes, some of them have it more difficult. Tonight we are focusing on Pennsylvania in particular. So, all right, as I've mentioned, um, we're probably gonna answer a lot of your questions as we move through the talk tonight. Um, we reserve some time at the end specifically for that. Um, so hold your questions till the end. It's okay to put them in the chat, but just know I'm probably not going to be answering those uh, until we get to the end of the presentation tonight. So why is it important to change your name? Well, the bottom line is, is that you have to use your name and show your identification on multiple occasions, right? And you know, the first place people often think about is you know, you know, maybe buying a drink or going to the grocery store, buying a bottle of wine or going through airport security. But the truth is there's lots of other times that you need to show ID. If you're gonna buy a cell phone under contract, chances are you have to show your ID. Um, if you, know, you are younger and you, you uh, look young, um, you might get carded at a drugstore if you wanna buy cold medicine or pick up a prescription. Um, if you're voting for the first time, you have to show your legal identification. We mentioned airport security, but also going on Amtrak, they may ask for your ID. Cashing a paycheck, um, applying and certainly being hired for a job, you have to show ID, applying for an apartment, and of course, you know, traffic stops or interactions with the police. So, you know, what happens if your gender presentation and your, your name on your ID don't match? Well, number one, you're outed, potentially stigmatized, potentially uh, leaving yourself open for um, uh, teasing and harassment. And in some cases, you may actually be in physical danger. I have a good friend who was in a bar and uh, the bartender outed them as a transgender person. And after they left the bar, they were physically assaulted. So it's important that we remember that you know, legal name change is not just about affirming our name, it's about our safety. And um, so this is why we encourage folks who really are thinking about it to do it and do it sooner rather than later. I do wanna have uh, just a little note here about minors. So if anybody here is the parent of a minor child. So if your child is under the age of eight, um, there is a separate process that doesn't require you to necessarily go through court. There's um, information on the, the back of the birth certificate where you can send that birth certificate into um, the Department of Vital Statistics in Harrisburg and uh, get the legal name change for your child without having to go to court. Unfortunately, there's a lot of misinformation out there. It used to be that um, anybody under the age of 18 could go through that process. That was changed about a year ago, and unfortunately, they didn't publicize it. Um, so the truth is, is that any kid who's nine years old or, um, I'm sorry, eight years old or older, they have to go through essentially the same uh, process as an adult. There's some things that you need to be thinking about, though. And the first one is, is that unlike as an adult going for a name change, it is virtually impossible for uh, uh, a judge to deny you a name change as an adult, um, except in some significant um, and unusual circumstances. But in the case of a child, um, the judge has a special duty to act in the best interest of the child. 
And as such, they have um, many more rights to deny that uh, petition for a name change. Um, and so it's really important that um, you know both biological or both adopted parents uh, consent to the name change. It's also recommended that you get letters from a therapist for a minor child um, affirming the uh, name change. And if they're uh, undergoing any kind of medical treatment, puberty blockers or hormones or any other treatment, that you get a letter from uh, a physician as well. If um, one of the parents does not affirm that uh, name change, um, we would strongly, strongly recommend that you consult with an attorney. Um, and we can guide people in that. Although I will say we've we've helped a, a number of uh, parents of minor children help them with their name their kids' name changes here. Other than that, these kind of um, things we just talked about here on the screen, the process for people over the age of eight is essentially the same for uh, it is as it is for an adult. So some things to kind of keep in mind there with regard to minors. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about the law. So the relevant law in the state of Pennsylvania is 54 PS, uh, 54 PA CSA 701. You can look that up, uh, it, you know, on uh, you know um, the various uh, legal services or even on the state's website. Um, and basically, what this uh, regulation says is that the state or the Commonwealth is concerned that an adult may wish to change their name to either avoid creditors. Um, or a history of criminal acts, and they want to use the, or that they want to use the new name to commit further criminal or fraudulent acts. And therefore, they make you file a petition with a court um, in order to obtain, obtain a name change. In addition, um, adults are required, and this is not just for trans people, it's for anybody who wants to change their name. Uh, adults are required by law to publicize the fact that their name is about to be changed. Um, although there are ways to avoid that, we're pretty successful at doing that for the most part. And we'll talk about that as we move through the process here. But this is what the law says, is that any adult can change their name um, as long as they kind of uh, prove to the court that they're not trying to avoid credit issues or commit uh, criminal acts or hide a criminal past. Um, and then there's process to do it. So uh, we'll get to publication in, in a, a little bit later on in the process here. Um, so a couple things around the law. So what the law says is that people who are convicted of felonies cannot change their name if they have less than two years before their sentence ends. So if you've committed a felony and been convicted of a felony, um, maybe you're in prison, um, uh, except for certain felonies, such as homicide, sexual crimes, arson, robbery, or aggravated assault. Um, uh, you can get your name changed if you have more than two years left on your sentence. If you have less than two years on your sentence, you have to wait until you've served your sentence. Um, however, the state Supreme Court, just in this past like six months, ruled in favor of three transgender women one from Pittsburgh, two from Pennsylvania or from Philadelphia, who had been convicted of homicide, and the uh, Pennsylvania Supreme Court uh, ruled that they could in fact change their names. So, if you have been convicted of, you know, homicide, sex crimes, you know, or you know, significant high-level um, felonies, it is possible to change your name. Um, Unfortunately, a lot of judges, especially in rural counties, may not have gotten the message yet. And so you're probably going to have to do a bunch of education. And in that case, we may want to recommend that you use an attorney. OK, um, so this is what the law says, although um, uh, court rulings are starting to make some changes on this. Um, additionally, around the law, the state gives each county a uh, fairly significant amount of autonomy with regard to the procedures and processes, right? So what the law says is that there has to be this criminal background check. The law says that they have to do a financial background check. And the law says that you have to publish um, your intent to change your name. Other than that, it doesn't give any real detail. And so what that means is every county in the state of Pennsylvania, so Philadelphia County, Montgomery County, Allegheny County, Bradford County, every county does it just a little bit differently. 
not significantly, but just enough to sort of be a pain in the rear. So, um, uh, you know, it could be that, for example, in Bucks County, when you go get fingerprinted for the criminal background check, they say that you have to use the police station in the town where you reside. Uh, on the other hand, in Berks County, for example, if you're in Redding, they require you to only use the sheriff department station that is in the county courthouse. Um, and for example, in Lehigh County, where I live, I can go to any police station and get um, fingerprinted. Um, so there are some differences. We're going to talk about how to find out what those differences are in a bit. Um, it also includes preferences for the style of court documents. So if you were to go on our website and download court documents by county, you'll find that um, Luzerne County looks different, for example, than Lancaster County's documents to one degree or another. They all do the same thing. Um, they're all legal. Um, matter of fact, you could use a Luzerne County document in Lancaster County, um, but they might look at you a little bit funny because they, they prefer to have their own documents used. Um, and then individual judges have um, discretion in terms of how these laws are applied. And this is uh, in particular with regard to that publication requirement that I mentioned earlier, right? So uh, in some counties, and we're going to talk about how to get that waiver, um, some counties, the judges are really cool and they will give that waiver almost every time. In other counties, the judges aren't quite so accommodating. So the bottom line is, is that you always want to verify what the preferences are in your local county. And our organization for the areas that we serve, so we're serving about 20 counties right now for legal name change, um, we can help you with that. Um, but you may also want to reach out to what's called the Office of the Prothonotary. So prothonotary is a fancy word for clerk. Um, and they're the people that keep track of all the records around legal name changes. And um, they can become your best friend. As I said, the prothonotary really is your best friend. Um, keep in mind that the people in the, the clerk of court's office and in the prothonotary's office, um, they are bureaucrats. Um, their job is to kind of push paper. Um, and if you go in, you have a bad attitude, they're going to give it right back to you. But generally speaking, if you go in and you visit with the prothonotary, they know, the staff there knows that for people of transgender experience, a legal name change is a big deal. And they will often go out of their way to help you. Um, and they will provide you with information on local procedures. If um, there are documents that they prefer that you file and file them in a certain order, they can do that. They can help you understand the timing and the processes for how the process is going to work. So while tonight we're going to cover the name change process kind of in general, um, your local county could be different from the county uh, next door. And the prothonotary is the office that can help you with that. We actually have a very good relationship with many prothonotary offices around the state. So here's the name change process at a glance. And that link that we put into the chat uh, earlier on, and I'll put it in the um, uh, chat again here when we get down to the end, um, uh, has this full um, kind of flow chart in it. But at a high level, there's really six steps. So the first one is, is that you're going to get fingerprinted. This is for a criminal background check. Then you're going to complete your court documents. Um, again, we can often help you with that. Um, then you're going to file your petition with the court. So you're going to go to the prothonotary's office and file your paperwork, pay a fee. Um, and then um, you're going to go do the background check stuff, right? So this is the publication in the paper, um, as well as a judgment search, which is the financial background check. Then you're going to attend a court hearing. And then once they give you the name change, you're going to update your identity documents. So your driver's license, state ID, social security, um, passport, birth certificate, and other documents like that. So at a high level, there's six steps. As you can see from this other chart on the right, though, um, there are some decisions that you have to make that could uh, create some additional steps. And we'll talk about a lot of those tonight. So first off is fingerprinting. So most counties require a manual paper fingerprint card. And often we get a question from people, I just had one uh, yesterday. So this is somebody who actually works in, in the security sector and they've had to be fingerprinted in order to get a security clearance. They go like, well, I've already been fingerprinted. Well, 
congratulations, you have to get fingerprinted again. And in most counties, you can't go to um, the local UPS store, FedEx store, and get your fingerprints done um, electronically. You have to get a paper card. So the best place to pick up that paper card is at the courthouse. So you go to your local county courthouse. Typically, you're going to go to either the um, court administrator's office or the law library that is located in the courthouse. Tell them that you're um, doing a legal name change. They will give you a fingerprint card that looks like this. The difference being is this part here inside this red circle is going to have um, all the coding necessary for their local courthouse. So you need to make sure that you're getting the fingerprint card that has all the information for the courthouse. Um, so you go to the state police, for example, or you might go to the sheriff's department. It might be the police in the town where you reside. Again, this can vary county to county. So you want to verify that with the prothonotary's office. Um, they're going to ink you up. They're probably going to charge you like $12 cash only, by the way. They don't take checks. Um, then they're going to give you the fingerprint card back. All right. It usually takes all of five minutes. We do recommend that you call, for example, here in Lehigh County. Um, most people go to the state police barracks, call the state police ahead of time and um, ask them what days and times they can do the fingerprinting because they don't do it all the time. Um, so give a call ahead of time just to make sure that you're going to be uh, able to get served appropriately. All right. We do also um, recommend that you bring a copy of your court documents with you. Sometimes the police station will go like, well, why do you want the fingerprint? And that way you can show them exactly what it's for. Okay. So we also recommend that you make a photocopy of the fingerprint card before you submit your petition to the court. That way, if something goes sideways, it gets lost in the mail, um, you know, you have proof that you tried to make the attempt. Always keep copies of all of your paperwork. All right, so now we're gonna go over the court documents. And most counties, not all, but most counties use um, the state approved uh, cover sheet form. So this is what it looks like here. And you're going to complete section A, which is just this part right up here at the top, right? And whoop. So you're going to put in yourself. You are the lead plaintiff, and you're going to leave the defendant part blank. Um, you are then um, going to uh, check no, it's not an appeal. No, it's not a class action suit. No, you're not asking for damages, right? Um, and then you're going to check this box next to this red text that says that you're a self-represented party. So the only time you would uh, have this filled in here in the top is um, if you had an attorney. And if you have an attorney doing, for it, doing it for you, um, they're going to fill this all out for you anyway. The only other piece uh, that you need to take care of on this document is in this lower right-hand corner where it says miscellaneous. You're going to check the box that says other and you're gonna um, type in or write in the words name change. It's all you gotta do, ignore everything else on this. So you just fill out the top really with your name, you check no, 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 you check um, that you're self-represented and then you're gonna check other and then put in um, um, that it's for a legal name change. A few counties will have their own version of this document. So for example, Carbon County, does not use this form. They use a local form um, from the county. Um, we provide those for the counties that we serve. Um, but again, you know, the people in the prothonotary's office are usually pretty helpful. They will help you fill out this form if need be. So the next document that you're going to bring is the petition. So the petition is where you are asking the court to change, you know, your name from, you know, John to Joan or whatever your dead name is to your chosen name, right? So um, it has to contain the following. Again, in every county it looks a little bit different, but it has to state your desire and the reason for your name change. So you're going to say, I want to change my name because I am a transgender individual. And this will help me get all of my legal identification aligned with the name that I use on a day-to-day -day basis. 
So the reason you use is I am a transgender individual. I use the name, fill in the blank, and a legal name change will help me align my legal identification with my chosen name. Those are really the exact words, okay? Um, so you have to say that, you know, I, I'm asking the court for a name change from John to Joan. The reason is because I'm a transgender individual. You have to have your current address in there, the mailing address, as well as the physical address. So if they're different, um, you, you know, like you use a post office box, you're going to put in the physical address and then put um, in parentheses your mailing address with the PO box. Um, and then you also have to fill in the addresses for any prior addresses you've had over the last five years, whether that is in state in a different county um, or out of state in a different county, or even if it's um, um, in another country, you have to fill those in. And we'll come back to that in a few minutes as well. Um, and then um, it also has to be accompanied by that fingerprint card, right? Again, your county may have a preferred format for this document. If you go to our website, we have um, the county by county documents for about 20 counties in the state. Um, we also have a generic one that works really for any county. But again, some counties have a preferred document. So you may wanna check with your local courthouse. Um, some tips. First off, print neatly if you're printing this. So my name is Corinne, spelled with one R and two Ns. Um, I have horrible handwriting. I should have had my spouse fill out the form for me. When they um, did my final name change, they misspelled my name and I had to go back to court and fix it. So we don't want that to happen to you. So make sure that you print neatly. The other thing, is that in almost all places, in all of the documents that we're talking about here, you're going to use your current legal name. The only times you're gonna use your chosen name is where it says change name to. So for example, on this segment here, you see on the screen, it says in the matter of a petition for the name change of, this would be your current legal name. Then it says petitioner, blank. This is your current legal name. The only places you're gonna put in your chosen name is where it says change name from current legal name to chosen name. So in almost all cases, you're gonna use your current legal name. Um, hopefully after all this is done, you never need to really do that again, but um, please make sure that you do that correctly. Um, and then in any place in all of these documents where it says petitioner, you're going to sign and you're gonna sign using your current legal name. Okay. Um, some counties require what's called a verification. So a verification is just a statement that says that you've told the truth in the prior document, right? Um, and so it just says that, you know, again, and then regarding the name change of, you're gonna use your current legal name, I, current legal name, um, certifying that I just told the truth in that petition, and then you're going to sign it, okay? Not all counties require it. Um, all it is is just a certification that you're telling the truth. Um, the next thing you're going to supply in your packet to the prothonotary is an order, right? So this is supplied to a convenience to the judge. So this is the document that they would sign at the end when everything is all said and done, this is the document that they sign. It says that they have in fact approved your name change from your old name to your uh, chosen name. Um, at the end of the process, they're gonna sign it. Um, they're going to send it back to that office of the prothonotary. And then you're going to go down to the prothonotary's office. Sometimes you can do it the same day. Sometimes you will do it the next day business day, um, and you want to pick up four or five official sealed copies of this order. The reason why you need these copies is because you need one for your state ID or your driver's license. You need an official copy for changing your social security. You need an official copy for your passport. 
you need an official copy for the birth certificate, and then you need to have one that you keep forever in a safe place. Okay, so we're gonna provide this document to the court really just as a convenience to them. The next thing that um, you will have in your packet is what's called a notice of publication. So this is an order that you receive from the court. This one here is from Bucks County. And this is the order that tells you that you have to publish in um, two uh, publications in your county of residence um, that say that you are changing your name. So essentially what this uh, these notices say is that um, John Smith is changing their name to Jones Smith. And if anybody has a problem with this, they should show up in court at 10 a.m. on the date of your hearing, whatever it is, okay? Um, so if and only if you're required to publish uh, your intent to change your name, you're gonna uh, get this order um, back from the judge. And then they're gonna tell you that you need to publish in two different publications. One is your closest local newspaper to your address of general distribution. So you can't put it like in the penny saver, right? You have to put it into a real newspaper. So if you're in the Lehigh Valley, that's the morning call. If you're in Reading, Pennsylvania, that's the Reading Eagle. If it is in Pen uh, Philadelphia, it's gonna be the Inquirer um, or the Daily News. If it is, if you're up in Scranton, it's the Scranton Times, for example, right? Um, so your closest new local newspaper of general circulation, um, and then you also put it in the county law journal. So this is um, published you typically by the um, Bar Association. Okay, the good news is, is we're gonna teach you how to hopefully avoid this publication. Um, but if you do end up having to do it, a couple things to keep in mind. First off is the ads only run for one day. Second is that the ads are teeny tiny. They're little classified ads. They run in the back of the paper. And the third thing is, is that very, very few people actually read the entire newspaper anymore. Matter of fact, a lot of people don't read newspapers at all. Um, I think I'm one of the only people in my neighborhood that still actually gets a, a paper newspaper, a physical paper. Most people don't get that. And if they're online, they're really just looking at the headlines, okay? The next thing that you are gonna provide the court though, is the motion to waive publication. So this is a document where you are requesting to the court to waive the requirement to publish your intent to change your name. There is only one reason by law that you can ask for that waiver. And that is that you are concerned about your personal safety, right? So examples of areas of concern would be, you know, that you are getting threats or you have a fear of getting threats, um, that you have personally um, uh, suffered from assault or threats of assault or violence, um, or that you have uh, a concern about that, right? Um, judges have a huge amount of discretion in this matter. So for example, um, in Lehigh County where I live, we have never, ever, ever lost one of these motions. On the other hand, um, in uh, uh, York County, we rarely win these motions. So um, it really depends a lot on the judge and it depends a lot on the case that you make. So what's gonna happen is you're gonna submit this motion to the court. When you get it from us, it's about 10 pages long because we quote the law back to the judge. And then we also have attached a research paper that speaks to violence against transgender people. And then we're also going to prep you on the things that you need to say. And in summary, what we're going to say is that when you appear before the judge, you have to go to a hearing in open court and the judge is gonna say, why should I grant this motion? And you're gonna say, because I'm a transgender individual and I'm afraid for my personal safety, the safety of my family and the safety of my property. The judge then may ask you if you have ever um, experienced threats or assault because you're transgender. If you have, 
and you say yes to that, they're probably going to ask you to recount that story. So um, if you have examples from personal experience, be prepared to tell that story. Include dates, times, places, and names if you can, specifics as much as you can. If you have a police report, you know, produce a copy of that police report. If you have not experienced assault or harassment, then what you can say is um, attached to this motion is a research paper from a scholar that um, speaking about elevated risks of violence against transgender people um, and publishing in the paper will out me as a transgender individual and put my uh, life and safety at risk. The other thing that you can say is that I know people of transgender experience who have um, suffered from threats or violence, and you can all truthfully say that because you now know me, okay? And then the other thing that we recommend that you say, and this is how you close the argument, is you say that in the last 18 months, seven transgender people have been murdered in the state of Pennsylvania, and I don't wanna be the eighth. And then you shut up and you look the judge right in the eye. Now, the judge, again, like I said, has a lot of discretion in this matter, and they may say that you don't have to publish, and if that's the case, they're going to sign an order that says that you don't have to publish. Make sure that you get a copy of that order and hold on to it for your final hearing. If they say, sorry, you do have to publish, you can still make an argument and say, your honor, with your permission, would it be possible that I only publish in the law journal and not in the newspaper, right? So the newspaper is general wide distribution. The only people that read the law journal are, uh, are attorneys, okay? And we have had some success with that strategy where if you say, you know, if the judge says you have to publish, you make the argument back, would it be possible, your honor, for me to only publish in the law journal? Um, and that um, uh, we have had some success with that. Um, but in some counties with some judges, um, it is possible they are going to make you publish. And that's just frankly the facts of life. Um, so again, if you have questions on this, um, you know, you can send me an email. I'll put my contact information in the chat here at the end of the evening. And you can certainly send me an email and I can give you some additional guidance on that if you have a question. Okay, so you're gonna fill out all those documents, right? So you've got the, um, the uh, cover sheet, you have the petition, you have the motion to waive, you may have a couple of verifications. Um, you're gonna have a whole packet of documents. You're gonna bring that along with the fingerprint card and about $250 in cash with you to the courthouse, to the office of the prothonotary and submit all your documents, okay? Um, some counties um, require electronic submission of documents, um, but you can largely ignore that. What happens is that you'll walk in with your paper documents. The only people that have access to the electronic system are lawyers. Um, so you can walk in with your um, handwritten documents, your typewritten documents, um, and then they will put them into the electronic system for you. They may charge you a small fee for that, like $25. Um, we do recommend that you um, call the prothonotary's office ahead of time and you say, I'm going to be submitting a petition for legal name change and a motion to waive publication. How much is the fee for that? So in some counties, you know, it's 150 bucks. In other counties, it's 250 bucks. So you want to ask ahead of time if you can. They will only take cash or money order. Some counties will take a credit card. They will never take a check. Okay. So make sure that, you know, what we tell people is, you know, you walk into that courthouse with about $250 in cash on you so that you can make sure that you're covering all the costs. Okay but you can call ahead, just ask, say, for a petition and a motion, 
how much is it going to cost? So after you submit, so you're going to walk into the office and you're going to say, I'm here to submit a petition for legal name change along with a motion to waive publication. Here is all of my documentation. They're going to review all that documentation, make sure that everything is signed off. And then they're going to schedule you likely for two hearings. So the first hearing is for the motion to waive publication. In some cases, they may put, tell you to go right in front of a judge right away. So for example, in Northampton County, they have something called motions court every single day. And so you can, you know, from the, you submit your paperwork and then you can go straight upstairs to appear before a judge to have them hear your motion. And so some counties will do that. Other counties will schedule that hearing for, you know, a couple of weeks out. Okay. They will also uh, likely schedule you uh, either that same day or they'll schedule it when you go to motions court, a final hearing date. Typically, your final hearing date is going to be 60 to 90 days out from the day that you submit all your documents to the court. Okay. Um, in between that time of when you submit your motion to the court and they hear your motion to um, when you have your final hearing date, you will need to, if they tell you you have to publish, you will need to publish in the papers and get what's called a proof of publication. Those ads, if you have to do it, need to run in the paper at least 30 days before your final hearing. So if you know they told you um, that your final hearing is on December 1st, that means that you would need to be putting your ad in the paper right now so that you had that 30 day runway. When you put the ads in the paper um, and the law journal, when you call them up to put those at place those ads, you're gonna tell them that you need them to send you what's called proof of publication. So proof of publication is a legal affidavit that they sign that says what day the ad ran and what the ad said, okay? The other thing that you need to do is get what's called a judgment search. Um, sometimes it's called a lien search. Sometimes it's called a name search. Um, so the judgment search is where they're going to do a financial background check on you to make sure that you know you are not you know up to debt in your eyeballs, that you don't have um, crazy amounts of debt that you haven't been making payments on. We'll talk a little bit more about this in a few minutes. Um, in most cases, this is done right at the courthouse, right? So uh, for example, in Lehigh County, they have you do it at the Recorder of Deeds office. In Chester County, they have you go to Orphan's Court, believe it or not, um, and um, do it there. Uh, in some places, it's uh, the profanitary that'll do it directly. But more and more counties, this includes, for example, Berks County and Monroe County, um, they require you to use what's called a title search firm. So this is uh, a, a private company that exists outside of the courthouse. Um, they usually specialize in um, real estate transactions and they have you engage that private, private firm to do this judgment search. Typically, if a courthouse is doing it for you, there's like a $40 fee. If you're doing it outside with this title search firm, it can be anywhere from 40 to $100, all right? And again, um, if you're in one of the counties that we serve, we can give you guidance on this. We can tell you where to go. Um, if you're in a county outside of our service area, um, the profanitary's office is the people who can tell you um, where to go. Um, when you get that judgment search done, so you're going to engage them the day that you submit your paperwork, um, but you're going to pick up a copy of the judgment search, typically a day, no more than two days before your final hearing. So if your final hearing was on December 5th, on December 3rd or 4th, you would go either to the courthouse or to the um, title search firm to pick up a copy of that judgment search. They are supposed to send it to the judge but it's better for you to have a copy of it just to be safe, okay? The other thing is, is that if you have lived anywhere else over the past five years, so for example, I live in Lehigh County, 
Um, previously, I lived in Loudoun County in Virginia. Um, I had to get a judgment search done in Lehigh County where I reside, and I also had to get a judgment search done in Virginia, okay? And you can do that usually over the phone. So you have to get that judgment search done in every place that you've lived over the past five years. So if you're, you know, at the point where, you know, you've lived in your current county for four and a half years, maybe you want to, you know, if, if the other place you've lived is, you know, far away or, you know, hard to get a hold of, maybe you wait six months for your name change. Okay. Um, just always follow your local county's rules, right? So some counties, like I said, it's done, you know, right at the prothonotary's office. For example, Montgomery County does it that way. Um, you know, other counties will have you use like the recorder of deeds, for example, in Lehigh County. If you're in Berks County, they make you use the title search firm. So just make sure that you're checking with the prothonotary and uh, verifying what their rules are. Okay. So next, after all this stuff, all this paperwork and getting everything ready, you're going to have your final hearing date. So the first thing to do is dress appropriately. We tell people that you go before the judge, dress like you would going to a job interview. So that means like no flip-flops, right? That means no shorts, no halter tops. Um, you know, dress, you know, in slacks or good jeans, you know, a nice top, you know, or a button-down shirt if you're trans mask. Um, but, you know, dress appropriately like you would for a job interview. Get to the courthouse early. And then when you get to the courthouse, make sure you're bringing copies of everything with you, right? So you should have a copy of the petition that you submitted. We want you to bring a copy of that motion for the waiver. And if you got, um, got the waiver, you're going to bring the order that says that you don't have to, didn't have to publish. If you did have to publish, you're gonna bring your proof of publication. You wanna bring a copy of that judgment search, bring a copy of that fingerprint card with you. So everything that you submitted to the court, have a copy with you. The judge is supposed to have all that stuff when you walk into your hearing, but it's not unheard of that people lose paperwork. So this way, if the judge says, no, I don't see the judgment search here, you can say, I got it right here for you, you honor and you can hand it to them, okay? So um, bring a copy of everything with you. We do recommend that even before you check in with the court officer that you go to that office of the prothonotary one more time, make sure that they have in fact sent everything up to the judge. It's just worth a, a final check on that. Then you're gonna go to the courtroom where you've been assigned and you're gonna check in with the court officer, tell them that you're there for a legal name change. Be prepared that when they call your case, they may call you by your dead name, right? So they may you know, say, hey, you know, Mr. Smith or Ms. Smith is opposed to what your chosen name is. Um, so just be prepared for that. Um, then um, you're going to uh, check in with that court officer, okay? You're gonna be called, you're gonna be sworn in, tell the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth. Um, be prepared to hand over the paperwork if the judge doesn't have it. If they ask you any questions, make sure that you answer honestly and succinctly. Um, and you're going to find that it's really anticlimactic. Typically, these hearings last all of five minutes for an adult. Okay. Um, I want to talk a little bit about these questions here. So judges tend to be a little bit older. They tend to be a little less than well-informed about issues impacting the transgender community. And um, so they may ask you questions that could feel inappropriate or even potentially triggering, and I want you to be prepared for those. So for example, they may ask you if you've been um, under the care of a therapist. They may ask you if you're under a doctor's care. They may ask you if you're on hormones. They may ask you if you've had surgeries. Um, they may ask you if you have supportive family. Um, these questions, frankly, are none of their business. But it never pays to get into an argument with a judge, especially when you want them to do something for you, like grant a name change. 
So if they ask you if you've had a therapist, you know, many of us have, you're just going to say, yes, I have, Your Honor. If the answer is no, you just say, no, I have not, Your Honor. Okay. They ask you about um, hormones or surgeries, you just answer the question, right? Just say, yes, I've been on hormones for six months or for six years or for whatever the answer is. If they ask you about surgeries, you know, if the answer is yes, you can say, yes, I've had surgeries. You don't need to get into details. Um, if they, if you have not had surgeries or you are not on HRT, what we recommend is that you say, no, not yet. I don't care if you're ever going to get surgery. I don't care if you're ever going to get on hormones. Frankly, the judge really doesn't care, right? But when you say not yet, that kind of tells them that you're thinking about this as you move forward. The thing that I want you to keep in mind as you're going through these hearings is that other than if you've been convicted of some of these horrible felonies, or if there is some really crazy stuff around debt that um, you have on your credit history, they cannot deny you a name change. By law, they cannot deny the name change. So just kind of keep your eye on the prize. Okay. All right. So the judge is going to get down to the end. They're going to go check. I've got the judgment search. Check. We've got the criminal background check. Check. They've signed all the documents. Check. I've got the order. And they're going to say, congratulations. You are now legally known as Corinne Goodwin. All right. Now the real work begins. All right. So when you change your name and gender marker, right, the court order isn't everything you got to do. That really just kind of starts the process. You've got to change your driver's license and your state ID. You need to change your social security card. We strongly, strongly recommend that you get a passport if you haven't got one now. Um, the birth certificate, frankly, is optional, right? And depending on where you were born, um, some states make it relatively easy to change your birth certificate. I, for example, was born in a state that makes it you know, particularly hard to change your birth certificate. So I never have. I use my passport for everything because I could get my passport even with my dead name on my original birth certificate and a copy of the court order from the judge. And my passport works for getting hired. My passport works for everything. It has my current legal name on it. It has my gender marker, has everything that I need. Um, if you are uh, an immigrant, um, and you have a green card or you have naturalization papers, you're going to need to get those documents updated. And of course, there's a tons of other stuff, right? Um, so everything from your bank accounts to your wills to your whatever it is. Um, again, I put in a link earlier and I'll put it in before we're done today, um, kind of a checklist for all that stuff. A couple things that you need to do, though, is while you're going through the name change process with the court, you also want to get with your physician if you intend to change your gender marker. So if you intend to change your gender marker, for example, in my case, from male to female on your um, Pennsylvania birth certificate, you have to have a letter from your medical doctor on their letterhead stating that you have had appropriate medical treatment for gender transition. They don't have to say what it is. It doesn't mean hormones. It doesn't mean surgeries. It can just mean that you've had a conversation with your doctor about gender transition, but they need to write you that letter because um, you need it for the birth certificate. Um, Social Security literally like two weeks ago changed their policy. They used to require that letter. They no longer do. But um, we are recommending that you still, if you go in for your social security card, you bring a copy of that letter from your doctor with you because it's gonna take them a while to train tens of thousands of social security employees on the process. And it might just make it easier for you, all right? So if you're um, having medical transition or even if you're not having medical transition, but you wanna change your gender marker, you need to make sure that you're getting that letter from your doctor. You can, you know, you can do it while you're going through all this other stuff, okay? Um, we have resources on our website about this. 
And um, also you can go to the National Center for Transgender Equality. They have um, information on getting your identity documents changed for every state in the country. I see somebody asked about, um, it doesn't change your number. I'm assuming you mean social security number. Yeah, so your social security number stays the same, okay? But you need to get your name updated on your social security records. It'll get you a new card. The good news is most of these things are pretty straightforward um, and you wanna do them in the order that I have here on the screen. So the driver's license or your state ID, you can do that the exact same day um, that you get your court order. It costs $30. Then you do your social security card. We strongly recommend that you make a personal appointment and you go into the social security office and do it directly there. The reason is, is they require an official copy of your original birth certificate to do your name and gender marker change. If you do it by mail, they are world class at losing paperwork. So instead of mailing in your birth certificate and having taking the risk of having them lose it, do it um, in person at the social security office. You'll get your new social security card within about two weeks. Then do your passport. All right, the passport costs about $160. Um, but it, like I said, it's the best legal ID you can have. Um, and you can get your name and gender marker changed on it um, without having to get that doctor letter from a doctor. Um, then um, if you are an immigrant, do your immigration paperwork next. Um, do your birth certificate last. Uh, in Pennsylvania, we just had one of our clients, it took an entire year for them to get their birth certificate back. Um, the Department of Vital Records in Pennsylvania is a train wreck right now, and um, it takes forever. So get all the stuff that you use on a day-to-day -day basis done first. And then if you wanna get your birth certificate done, do that one last. I see someone asked a question, um, do you need to get the physician letter for changing to non-binary? Um, if, for example, um, Pennsylvania driver's license, you can, you can choose uh, a non-binary uh, X marker um, without any kind of letter from anybody for anything. Um, Social Security, currently they only offer male and female gender markers. By this time next year, they will um, have an X gender marker available. So what we would recommend if you're a non-binary person is you change the name on the account now doesn't cost anything. And then, you know, like a year from now, you'll go back in and get the gender marker changed. Um, passport, you don't need the letter from the doctor. Um, birth certificate um, in Pennsylvania, they only offer male and female gender markers. So you'll probably end up sticking with the one that you, that you were assigned at birth, unfortunately. Um, uh, I'll talk about this in a little bit, but we're, we've actually introduced a series of bills in the state legislature that would allow for a non-binary marker, but right now that isn't the case. Um, immigration documents, it's, you only, you're stuck with either a male or a female designator. So um, the answer is, is that it's complicated if you're non-binary. Well, it's complicated for anybody. Okay. Um, so like I said, we have a checklist, you know, the kind of go through all the things that you need to change in order. This is actually an older version of that. Um, but uh, we'll, we'll put the uh, link to that in the uh, chat here in a few minutes. The thing is focus on what's most important first, right? So that is your driver's license, your social security, those kind of key IDs and your work, ec work records. Um, so those are all updated. Um, your insurance records and your medical records, they are like priority one. And then, you know, then all the other stuff kind of comes afterward, right? And so we, we have a, a complete list available for you that I'll put the link to. Um, and you may find that some items aren't worth your time. So for example, um, I travel a lot for my business and um, I tend to fly mostly on American Airlines. So I updated my frequent flyer account for American Airlines right away and my account for Marriott right away because I tend to stay in Marriott's. Um, uh, but I didn't update for Frontier Airlines because I fly Frontier Airlines like once every five years and I don't have any points with them anyway. So 
I didn't even bother changing Frontier Airlines. Um, so what is the cost? So depending on whether or not you have to publish in the paper, if you represent yourself, what is called pro se, um, typically, depending on the county, it's $300 to $700. So if you don't have to publish, you're probably in that $300 range. If, you're, if you do have to publish in the paper, you're probably you know, in the six to $700 range. If you decide that you don't want to do it yourself and you want to hire an attorney, um, nowadays it's usually costing about $2,000 to engage with an attorney. Um, and then you have to pay your court fees and your publishing fees on top of that. So um, obviously representing yourself as a pro se litigant um, can save you a lot of money. On the left of the screen here, you can kind of see, so for Lehigh County, right, the fingerprinting is about 25 bucks. The filing fee is 177. The judgment search with the recorder of deeds is 30 bucks. Um, the motion to waive publication costs you 28. If you do have to publish, it's 100 bucks for the law journal, 175 for the morning call. Um, and then copies of your orders cost $6, okay? Um, so understand that you know it's not cheap, but there are ways to save um, some money. Um, one of those is representing yourself, obviously. Um, another one is to file what's called informa pauperis. So if you are dead broke, right? So if you have no money in the bank, if you you know, your income is the same as the amount of money you're putting out, which for a lot of people right nowadays with inflation is true. You might even be spending more than you're taking in right now. You can file paperwork with the court. You could email um, me and I will send you these documents if you need them. Um, and what you're going to do is uh, inform a pauperis means in the manner of a pauper. All right. So essentially what you're doing is you're saying to the court, I am dead broke. So please waive the court fees, right? So this doesn't waive the publication costs, but it waives the cost of you know submitting your petition um, and doing the judgment search if it's done at the court and things like that. It might save you about two hundred dollars, right? Um, but you have to prove it, right? So they're going to make you fill out a financial statement on all this stuff. So if you are you know you know broke. You can file in form of Paul Paris. There may be a third hearing that you have to attend um, to speak to a judge about this, but you can do that to save money. You can also ask for pro bono legal representation. So for example, the Transgender Legal Defense and Education Fund in Philadelphia County and in um, Allegheny County, they have programs um, where you can apply done based on need, um, and you can apply to have a lawyer uh, represent you in court free of charge. Um, Temple Law School in Philadelphia, they have a program where their law students will um, uh, represent you and help you with your paperwork. Um, your county bar association, um, you can contact them uh, and they may be able to provide you with a pro bono um, uh, representation. There's also maybe your local LGBT center might have a, like a legal clinic where they're not going to represent you, but they could offer you some advice similar to what we do. Um, and then, of course, there's local legal aid services like Mid Penn Legal Services, East Penn Legal Services, Northern Western um, Legal Services, depending on where you are in the state. You can, again, apply for them for um, pro bono. Everything is based on need, um, but you could you could do it. And it's important to understand that you know, these organizations all have limited bandwidth. So, you know, they have more demand than they have um, the ability to supply it. You can also apply for a grant. So our organization, Eastern PA Trans Equity Project, um, we will not only offer mentoring and, and kind of help you through the process, um, but you can apply for a grant across our 16 counties in the state um, probably by the end of next year, it'll be 25 counties. And um, if you have a need, you know, we will very likely give you a grant to help you cover your court costs. 
All right, grants right now are $300. So assuming you don't have to publish in the paper, um, basically all of your court costs would be covered. Um, you can also apply with Trans Lifeline. So Trans Lifeline has a program called Micro Grants. Um, they give out, I wanna say it's 15 grants a month. Um, it is a national program. So you're going up against people from Wisconsin and Tennessee and California and Texas. Um, but you can always apply. I know people who have uh, received grants from them as well. Um, and, you know, please visit our website, patransequity.org. Um, a lot of the stuff that we have here um, is available on our website. Um, we will be taking this presentation and putting it on our YouTube channel. So you'll be able to play it back, stop and start um, as we kind of, as you walk through and completing your paperwork, for example. All right. So just as a reminder, we are not attorneys. We are transgender people who help other transgender people. What we've covered tonight is really for guidance and education, but we are not representing you in court. Um, if you have very specific legal questions that I am unable to answer for you here, I may tell you that you need to uh, get an attorney. If you are looking for uh, help with the name change of a minor, if both parents don't agree, again, we would strongly recommend that you engage an attorney. So with that, um, we'll do a little bit of Q&A. So feel free to write in the chat here uh, what your areas of concern are or what your questions are. I'm going to take just a second and put the uh, link for that uh name change process and checklist in the chat as well for you again, so you can go and download that. And then um, I'm here for you to answer some questions. So um, first question we hear is um, with regard to judgment search. So it says, I've lived in one other county in the last five years. I have more than a year to wait if I've been there for five years. I'm hoping to change my name before I get married. Is it possible to get a judgment search? without going to the county. So for example, this person is in Philly and they live. They used to live in Portland, Oregon. So the answer is um, call the county courthouse where you used to live in Portland, tell them that you were pursuing a legal name change and that you need a judgment search. Most courthouses will uh, do that um, uh, remotely. You know, they're going to chart, ask you for a credit card, you know, for whatever they're going to charge you for that judgment search, and then they will um, mail you the result of that. So uh, the answer is, is, you know, whether it's another county in the state or another county, you know, across the country, in this case, 3,000 miles away, you will need to still get that judgment search. Give them a call, right? Um, you know, on the other hand, if it's a county like right across the, you know, across the line, you know, maybe you want to go do it in person and just get it done. Okay. Any other questions we have here? So somebody says, are there suggestions for waiving publication if changing your name to general neutral or non-binary? Um, so yeah. So I'm going to give you some advice that um, I would I actually hate giving, but um, you know, I mentioned earlier that a lot of judges are kind of older and they don't get it. Um, they have dealt with transgender people for decades, frankly, um, but many judges may not understand what non-binary means. And so if you say I'm a non-binary individual and I'm concerned about um, violence against me, or you say, you know, I'm a non-binary person and that's why I want to get a name change, certainly within your right to do that. Um, the guidance I give to our clients is is just say you're trans, just say you're transgender um, because judges know what that is, right? Um, and so it just sort of smooths the process out a little bit. It's unfortunate that that's the case. Um, you know, you shouldn't have to educate um, these folks in the courthouse, but um, unfortunately, sometimes you may be in that situation. Um, so our recommendation really is just to say, you know, I'm a person of transgender experience, I'm concerned about violence against my person, uh, my property, and my family. Um, in the past year, um, you know, seven transgender people have been murdered in the, across the state of Pennsylvania. 
including a non-binary person, by the way, actually a two-spirit person. Um, and you know, we don't, I don't want that to happen to me or my family. So that would be my guidance to you. I'm happy to have a conversation offline on that if you want to send me an email. Um, in fact, let me put my email in the chat here. Um, So you can email at info at patransequity.org um, and then we will get back to you with um, answers to your questions as well. Um, so here's a question. My prothonotary's office is asking how long I've been using my chosen name. Could my answer have any impact on my case? If you are an adult, it shouldn't matter at all, right? So. Anybody can change, any adult can change your name for any reason they want to in the state of Pennsylvania, as long as it is not to hide a criminal past or to evade debt or to commit criminal acts, right? So if you're an ax murderer, they're not going to let you change your name, right? Um, if you say to the judge, I intend to commit ax murder, um, they're not going to let you change your name. But the, but the, um, the, amount of time that been, you've been using your chosen name should have no impact at all, okay? Um, on the other hand, do you want to get into an argument with them? So, you know, if the prothonotary says how long you've been using your chosen name, just say, you know, a year, two years, six months, whatever it is, make sure you tell the truth. Um, but, you know, it should have no bearing on your ability to get a name change. Okay, uh, next question here. Do some police stations give you the fingerprint card? Um, in this case, they're asking about a town in Bucks County, um, or do we get it from the courthouse? Um, we would recommend that you uh, call the courthouse uh, ahead of time and say, "Can you know?" Because I realize that the town you're in is, you know, it's a pretty good haul to where the courthouse is. Um, give the courthouse a call, um, but generally speaking, we're going to tell you to go to the courthouse and pick up a copy of the fingerprint card, um, and then. The conversation, next question was, I don't have a cover sheet for the court document. Is this something you can download? Um, send me an email to that address um, and I will get you a copy of the, um, of the cover sheet. I'll get you a copy of the cover sheet um, for your county. Um, we'll wait kind of another minute or two here to see if there's any other additional questions or concerns. Um, kind of the biggest things I want y'all to take away tonight is number one, um, as long as it's for an adult um, and you're not, you know, don't have any evil intent here, getting a legal name change while it is a pain and there's a bunch of hoops you have to jump through and a bunch of bureaucracy, um, it can be done and you can do it on your own. It just requires some perseverance and a willingness to deal with some bureaucracy. Um, you're gonna need to make two or three court appearances going to have to go to the courthouse probably four times um, prior to, your, you know, in total. Um, the second thing is, is that um, you can do it affordably. Um, you know, like I said, for as little as $300, most people can get that name changed on kind of at the high end. If you do it yourself, it's going to be about $700. Um, and then, you know, the, the last thing that, you know, I really want you all to know is that we are here to help you. So this year, we have helped over 350 people complete legal name changes. Um, we're pretty good at what we do. Um, so if you have questions, please reach out. Um, and then finally, is that remember that the prothonotary at that courthouse, they really can be your best friend, right? So it, as processes change and things like that, um, they can um, be very helpful with making sure that you know about the latest and the greatest. And then um, additionally, um, and I'm not making any promises here, but you know, just you, you treat everybody at that courthouse like they're, they're your best friend, right? You treat them really well and they may get you in with a judge who is um, more inclined to be affirming, more inclined to give you that waiver. You know, I can't make you any promises, but just remember, those people in the courthouse, you treat them with respect, they will likely treat you with respect. So I don't see any other additional questions. Let me just double check here. I think we're good. 
Oh, one more message. Somebody's asking about Montgomery County. So I'm not sure what the question is about Montgomery County. So I'll give you a chance to let me know what the question is. I will tell you that, um, so we've actually done some training with the judges in Montgomery County. Um, um, so the question is, is, how are the judges in Montgomery County? So um, like I said, for an adult name change, um, there are no issues at all, right? Um, I will tell you that there is one judge in particular who's a little conservative, a little old fashioned, and they may ask you some of those questions I asked about earlier, you know, about have you seen a therapist? Are you on HRT? You know, are you under a doctor's care? How long have you been in transition? They may ask those questions, which could feel uncomfortable. But again, if you are an adult, um, you cannot be denied that name change as long as you're not doing anything, you know, illicit. Um, and then uh, I will say in the case of minors, um, the judge that typically does the name changes in Montgomery County, um, they are conservative. Um, we strongly, strongly recommend, we recommend this in any county, but Montgomery County in particular, um, in York County in particular, that um, number one, both parents are in attendance at those hearings. Both parents need to be affirming um, that um, you get a letter from a therapist that says that uh, they are in support of the name change. And then you show up at that courthouse with an army. So mom's there, dad's there, grandma's there, you know, you know, best friends there, whatever it is, go in with that army because what the judge is going to ask, because again, for minors, the judge is required to do what they feel is in the best interest of the minor child. And if they see that mom, dad, grandma, and aunt Jane are all, you know, there for the kid, they are more likely to give that positive affirmation. Um, uh, if you have questions in particular about minors, you know, email me separately. Okay, so next question is, if I change my first, I'm not sure I understand this question. If I change my first and last name being married, will my spouse need to change their last name? So if I understand the question correctly, um, if you decide to change your name, first, middle, last, or whatever it is, your spouse doesn't have to do a darn thing, okay? Um, they may choose to change their name, um, but they don't have to. They don't have to, right? So, um, you know, when I change my first name and my middle name, uh, my wife didn't have to do anything. If I had changed my first name and my middle name and my last name to Smith, my wife could still keep um, her name, okay? Um, I will say that um, if people are getting married, um, the name change process for somebody changing their last name due to marriage is like super easy. Um, but uh, uh, changing, you know, first and middle names, those things are um, a little more complicated. Oh, one other thing that I just thought of. So when you complete your paperwork for the court, always make sure you use the complete name, right? So first name, middle name, last name. Um, don't you know, just say like, I'm changing my name from Joe to Joanne, you need to go, you know, Joan something Smith to, you know, John something Smith, whatever that is, make sure you use the complete name in all of your paperwork. Okay, let's see if anybody else, any other questions? We're going to give you another couple minutes here. And if not, we will call it. All right, so I really appreciate you all coming out tonight. Um, this seminar will be on um, our uh, YouTube channel here in a couple days. Uh, and meanwhile, if you have a question, please feel free to send an email. Um, remember that if you're in one of our uh, counties, you can apply for a grant, you can download your paperwork um, off of our website, uh, includes all the written instructions. So thank you all for coming out tonight. I hope you have a wonderful, wonderful evening. Bye-bye.